Welcome to church. My name is Nathan, and today is a good day. It's a good day because we worship a good God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth, says Psalm 100. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. For our service today, we're doing something a little different. Today, the focus is on the good news of the gospel and the goodness of our God. And with Psalm 100 ringing in our ears, let's get ready to sing praises to our good God. You have brought me back with the reaches of your amazing grace In the realms of a man alive, oh, and for me to life, oh, and for by your grace I'm saved I want one day to see a long and good place It's time Your grace, I'm saved. Here we go. 
days I've been held in your This week we've hit the middle of winter and it's been a wet and windy and wild week, hasn't it? And given those things, given what the last few months have been like for all of us, Bruce was intent that this week we inject some warmth into the service today. Now I'm doing my bit. Perfect. Today is Good News Sunday. Bruce will do a short talk on John 3.16 and the good news. And we'll also be hearing from a few different stories from some of you, reminding us all of the power of the gospel and the goodness of God. To start off, we're going to hear first from John and Trish Appleby. G'day, it's John and Trish Appleby. And we just wanted to uh, fill you in on some of the, the highs and lows of this interesting year that we've had. Um, we kicked off the year with a wonderful wedding celebration for my eldest son and his uh, now wife in Melbourne. And it was a great uh, celebration of our, our uh, blended family all yeah. coming together and celebrating. But then we came back to Sydney and we just got uh, caught up in this enormous change that has affected all of our lives with the coronavirus. And uh, well, there was great uncertainty for both Trish and I with yeah. our work. Yeah. Uh, Trish is a director in the childcare sector. We had no idea what was going to happen. And I work in health and my practice experience 
a probably a 75% reduction in turnover. So, and because of both of our age, we, we removed ourselves from um, working in the, in the front line. And we had no idea of what provision was going to be. But in this period of time, God has supplied all of our needs in every sphere. He's looked after our health. He's looked after our finances. He's looked after our food. He's looked after our families. He's looked after... John was off work for quite a while and um, so he was doing things around the house and we didn't have a lot of money to spend on around the house but all of a sudden, you know, paint came out of nowhere and, and decking oil came out of nowhere and... Timber. Um, timber, all the timber that we needed. The, the minutiae um, of God's yeah, provision just, for the smallest things. Yeah. We found that these things were just made available to us and uh, we're relying on uh, Trisha's... Uh, wages for yeah. a long period, about six weeks, uh, while I removed myself from work. Um, but we've both been blessed to have job security now and um, job keeper and income, and that's helped us enormously. Um, but it really was a, a great time of uh, looking at God's provision that, that, and looking at how we're allocating and spending our money and making us a bit more thoughtful about how we spend our money and yeah. what our priorities were. Um, so I just uh, want to give all the glory to God for the, the grace that he's shown us and um, all of our needs, there's been a sufficiency in what we've what God's provided. It, it has been just, it has been what we needed in, in a timely manner. Um, and I'm just so thankful. In my practice, I've got a new colleague who's reinvigorated and uh, opened the practice up to the dragged us from the 19th into the 21st century. Um, and as extraordinary things have happened there. And Trisha's had security at work mm. in the kindy. They've been blessed mm. with uh, government funding there. And we've both had JobKeeper. All of our children have um, been able to maintain and secure their employment. And, uh, you know, in all of these physical things, God's looked after us. But probably the biggest grace we've had is God's given us time uh, to spend with each other, to work on our relationship together in our marriage and our relationship with God. Mm. And while, you know, there are lots of wonderful stories about God's material provision, this time has been extraordinary. I've got two elderly parents who are very unwell at the moment. Um, they're both in hospital. And God's given me the time to be not stressed, but to spend time with them and to bring them to an understanding of God's love at this point in their life so that they can except with grace the, the, you know, the difficult things that they're facing and to be able to, uh, in a modest way, share Christ's love, uh, which is what we should all do as children, but to, to be given the grace of having that time to spend with our parents and our loved ones, I think has been an extraordinary uh, blessing in this really very difficult and very interesting time. I think too, you know, talking about time with people, um, John's had the time with his parents and my son has had, and his wife and family have had to be in ISO for quite a long time because of their um, youngest child. And as they've been coming out of ISO, um, we've been privileged to be the ones that have been spending time with them. Sharing church and occasionally. Sharing church at home with them. And it's just been really lovely quality time that God has given us as, our, you know, as grandparents with the kids. And that's, that's just been beautiful. Um, I think one of the other blessings, it was a blessing to be taken off the treadmill. Um, yep. You know, at the beginning of the year, we had all these plans. We planned for holidays. We planned to see people. Um, and then all of a sudden that was taken away. And um, I think it was a real special, it's actually been a real blessing to have the time to be with each other, to have the time to actually be looking at the Bible together. Um, I think that was really special. We actually, you know, in that time, we had time to look at the Bible mm. and, and um, you know, see different preachers online and compare different preachers online. And and um, so we did some really good, good things together um, during that time. So we just want to thank God for his grace because yeah. it's been sufficient and more than enough for all of our needs. So. Thanks, John and Trish, for sharing. It's easy to focus on everything that's going wrong at the moment, isn't it? But how good is it to be reminded that there's still stuff to give thanks to God for, 
that he remains a good God who is a giver of good gifts, even amidst the turmoil and uncertainty of this present moment. And we'll get to hear a few more stories a little later on. For now, though, the big thing I want to draw your attention to is that the winter sessions with John Dixon will be kicking off here next Sunday. It was great to see a big chunk of you who attended the Zoom training night with him just last Wednesday. And the second session with John is actually going to be happening same time, same place, this coming Wednesday. If you missed the first one, you can, of course, catch that up via our YouTube channel. Winter Sessions starts next Sunday. John's going to be with us for the next three weeks, a doubter's guide to Jesus. And it'll be the perfect opportunity for anyone who might be searching for answers, who might be looking for meaning, who might be asking questions about Christianity for friends or family or whoever, really. Anyone who wouldn't normally find themselves here at church, this is three weeks. That's perfect for them. So be thinking and praying about people you might like to invite along or share the service with. We're going to spend some time in prayer now. But just before that, if you've got little ones with you, head to the front page of our website, scroll down, hit the Kids Church link, because it's time for Kids Church Online. Hi, my name's Lauren, and it's my uh, pleasure and privilege to lead us in a time of prayer. So please join me. Heavenly Father, Holy Lord, you are the creator of the heavens and the earth, the Lord of all history, the sustainer of life. You are our good and faithful God. Who are we that you should be mindful of us? Who are we that you should care for us? We come before you in humility and reverence to offer up our prayers to you, almighty God. Lord, we lift up our nation and particularly Victoria, where there are increasing numbers of new cases of coronavirus. Please stop the spread of the virus and heal those affected. Please especially protect the vulnerable members of our society, the elderly, children, homeless, and those with existing poor health. We pray for the healthcare workers all across the world as they work in many different ways to help and protect us. We thank you for their efforts, skills, and sacrifices please protect them, resource them, and strengthen them through this tough time. Nothing is beyond your capabilities, Father. Please be merciful and bring an end to this pandemic. Lord, we thank you for our wonderful church family here at St. Matthew's, across all the congregations, the different ages and backgrounds. We are so richly blessed. May the Holy Spirit fill us up and overflow that we might fulfill the vision to grow your church through the gospel in Manly and beyond. We thank you that this gospel is not just words or talk, cursory actions or just well-meaning, but is inherently powerful, life-changing and brings salvation. We give thanks for our senior minister, Bruce Clark, as he leads us and seeks to apply this vision in all the varied aspects of church life. May he be equipped with wisdom, perseverance and a servant heart to lead us with a godly example, particularly through these uncertain times. We thank you for his amazing wife, Kathy, and pray for her ministry both within their family as she supports Bruce and in many other ways she serves in our community. And we commit to you the upcoming winter sessions with John Dixon. May we use this opportunity to be outward looking and genuinely seek to share the gospel message with those who don't know Jesus. Give us courage, wisdom and tact as we reach out to people and may many people tune in. And please use John effectively. Give him the words to say with power that people would come to know the truth. We pray for the work of our mission partners, the Fells on Norfolk Island. Lord, we thank you for Dave and Crystal. Thank you for leading them as they strive to profoundly love and serve the people there and share their lives and the message of the gospel with them. We pray that the church will be effective in building wholehearted disciples of Jesus for your glory and the sake of his name. We commit to you those amongst us, our friends and family who are in distress through sickness, depression, grief, financial difficulty, or who are overwhelmed as lives are turned upside down by coronavirus. Jesus, you are no stranger to the pain and suffering of humanity and know each of our struggles deeply for you care for us so dearly. Draw near to those in need, comfort them and give them rest and peace. We'll now take a minute to pray for those people on our hearts. Merciful Father, we lift these people, their lives, bodies, hearts, and souls up to you. We pray for emotional, physical, and spiritual healing, restoration where it is needed, and hope in the future, 
in Christ Jesus. Almighty God, your son Jesus, whom we love and follow, has promised that you will hear us when we ask in faith. Receive the prayers we offer, incline your ears towards us, not because of our efforts or merit, but by your grace and boundless love. Amen. My name is David and I'm a member of the 8am congregation at St Matthew's. It's my great privilege to be able to read a passage from John chapter 3, verses 16 to 21, which speaks of God's plan of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Welcome. Great to be back with you for this Good News Sunday. And for those who don't know me, I'm Bruce Clark. And as Nathan said at the very start of the service, today is Good News Sunday. I know it's COVID-19, it is winter, it's been wet and windy all week, but today's about having our hearts warmed by the great news of the gospel, as well as hearing some wonderful stories that will motivate us in wanting to serve Jesus. And to do that today, what I want to do is speak for a shorter period than normal on the great news of the gospel and then transition to hear three wonderful stories from members of our church about how this gospel is saving people, it's transforming people, as well as reaching people in this COVID-19 era. And the verse that I want to speak on today is probably the most famous verse of scripture in the whole world. It's John chapter 3, verse 16. And this verse is so well loved by Christians. In fact, you'll sometimes see just that word description, John 3.16, in sporting venues being hung up all around the world. Here it is on the face of an American football player, Tim Tebow, who used to wear this Bible verse on his face while he was playing. Such was his love for it and his desire for people to read it. Now, what does the verse say? Well, it's a great verse well known by people for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life and I think it's famous and so well loved because in the most simple and yet profound way it summarizes the good news of the gospel in just 26 words and so what I'm going to do is take us through those 26 words and make some reflections on them. And then I'm going to hand over to three of our members who are going to share their stories about how this gospel is saving, transforming and reaching people. But firstly, let's have a look at the first few words. For God so loved the world. The term good news comes from a Greek word that is translated as gospel in our English versions. And when you look at this word in the original uh, language, it basically meant good tidings or good announcement. And it was a word used in the ancient world that referred to an announcement of a happy or a significant event. And the early church took this word and applied it to the news about Jesus. They said, we've got a happy, a significant event that's taken place. And the gospel was all about announcing his birth, his life, his death and his resurrection over death. It was great news. And this gospel, this announcement, it literally is the foundation of what the church has believed through the ages. And the vision of our church at St Matthew's is that we will grow God's church through this gospel. And the good news is this, as we see at the start of this verse, God loves the world. For God so loved the world. 
And what's significant in this verse is not that God loves. I mean, we know that God is love. It's who he loves. And what John tells us is that he loves the world. And when you read John's gospel, the world is a description of humanity in rebellion against God. In fact, you read on just a few verses after John 3, 16, you get to John 3, 19, and it says this, light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. And what John is saying here is the world is a place that's rejected God. Light came into it, but the darkness rejected it. And the good news is God loves this world, this world of rebellion, of broken people, of people who are apathetic when it comes to believing in God, who turn their back on God. God loves this world. And importantly, he loves me and he loves you. And in spite of how we might have lived or treated God or believed in God or failed to live for God, he still loves us. Let me stop and ask us an important pastoral question. How would you change if you really knew that God actually deeply loved you? I mean, if in the depths of your heart, you actually knew that God was for you. You see, this is a truth that can revolutionise your life. To know that we're deeply loved and accepted, I think, is one of the most important needs that we have as people. That we don't have to chase approval because we know God loves us, because we're already approved by him. That we don't need to hold on tight in our lives to everything and be in control of everything in every situation. Because we actually know that God's in control and he loves me. And he will work that out for my good is what Romans 8.28 says. That we don't need to hold on to bitterness and resentment that can often just flavour our lives in dark ways. Because God's love has actually replaced the pain that can consume us. And you see, this is why the gospel is good news. God loves me and he loves you. But secondly, John goes on to say this. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And God gave his son, Jesus, not just any son. He gave us his unique son, his one and only son. And Jesus is God and he bears the very essence of God. You see, there are not many ways to God. There is but one way to God. And it's through his son, Jesus. And I know there are many uh, religions and there's many spiritualities in the world. But if we're to be honest, they are all just human attempts to try and find God. But God in his mercy and his grace has actually revealed himself to us by sending his son into the world. His only son, his one and only son. And it's through his one and only son, Jesus, that we come to know God. And when you know Jesus, you actually know the living God. And when you receive Jesus, you receive the very fullness of God into your life. Because Jesus bears the very essence of God in his body and person. And this is why we say the gospel is good news. It is great news. Because when you understand it, you get the clarity that you need to the question of who is God. And we can know God with certainty and confidence because his son, Jesus, has revealed God to us. The verse goes on to say that whoever believes in him. The third reason the gospel is good news is because it's for everyone who believes. In other, one, in other words, it's for whoever. It's for anyone and everyone. And you think with me about the people who came to Jesus in his ministry on earth. There's such a rich variety of the types of people, the everyone, the anyone. There was Joseph of Arimathea, rich. Nicodemus, religious. Mary Magdalene, broken. And the list just goes on and on. And you see this so very poignantly when you see the early church and the way they gathered together. I'm going to read for us uh, a verse from Acts chapter 13. And it's profound in its description of the early church. And what you see here with the early church is leaders who are so diverse, but they are gathered together in worship. Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 2. Let me read it to you. Now, in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who'd been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. 
While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Acts 13, verse 1 to 2. Now think with me about those leaders that were praying and worshipping together. You've got Barnabas. He was from headquarters. He's a Jew, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas because he was the son of encouragement. I imagine him as this very warm pastoral leader. You could say he was the insider, but then you've got Simeon called Niger, most likely because he was a dark-skinned North African. And it's quite possibly he was the Simeon who helped Jesus carry his cross. And then you've got Lucius, also from Cyrene and also of African descent. But next to him, you had Mannion. And the text tells us that he was brought up with Herod. And when it says he was brought up with Herod, it means he was brought up with the foster brother of Herod, as the foster brother of Herod, and most likely grew up in the royal palace with Herod. And so he's a complete outsider, a friend and legal relative to the killer of John the Baptist. And lastly, you've got Saul, the Pharisee, the great persecutor of the church, who formerly despised non-Jews and Christians and had put Christians to death. And here they all are together, racially, economically, spiritually, socially, as diverse a group as you could ever find, but they're now one in Christ, they are one in the Spirit, And they are praying and fasting and seeking the kingdom together. And you see, this is the good news of the gospel. Anyone and everyone can come and have their sins forgiven and receive eternal life from Jesus Christ. And my own experience as a pastor is exactly the same. I've seen people come to Christ from all walks of life, from all cultures in life, from all religious backgrounds in life. Because the gospel is for anyone and everyone, rich and poor, black and white, young and old. God loves us all. And the reason it's for anyone and everyone is because of what Romans 3, 23, verse 24 says. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. The gospel is for everyone. But lastly, this verse finishes by saying, and they shall not perish, but have eternal life. And the reality, very sobering reality under God is that people will perish. There will be people who perish. There is a heaven, the scriptures proclaim, but there is also a hell. And the gospel announces the good news about how each and every person can be reconciled with God and receive eternal life and not perish and not face hell. You see, in life, actions have consequences. I think it's one of the most important lessons that we've got to learn in life. It's what we teach our kids. What we do and how we live matters. And this isn't just true of life with each other. It's also in relationship with God. And people sometimes ask me, um, will God really judge people? And the answer is yes. Yes. Will God really send people to hell? And the answer is yes. In fact, Jesus spoke more about hell than anyone else. But the good news is this. God in his love for us doesn't want this to happen. And that's why he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to us. Because he loves us so much. And Jesus has died on the cross to take the punishment for our sins. And because of that, we can have eternal life if we come to him and put our belief in him. And he gives to us as a gift eternal life. And it's not just some pie in the sky thinking. This is a reality based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And there is a new heaven and a new earth that is coming when Jesus returns. And he will take everyone who trusts and follow him to be with him. It is the great news of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And when you understand this news, when you receive this good news, when you believe it, when you take it in, you are saved and you're transformed and you want it to reach others because it is the good news of God. And to illustrate how this good news saves people and transforms people and reaches people, we've invited a few people to tell their story on this Good News Sunday week. 
And the first person I'd like to introduce is a lovely young adult woman from our night service, Zara, who's been a Christian just a year. And Zara joined us uh, just over 12 months ago. And here's her story of her coming to faith and being saved by God. Hey guys, it's Zara. If you don't know me, I joined the Loving Family of St. Matt's about a year ago now. And I think after about three services, I became a Christian. So today I'm just going to quickly talk about my journey of faith and how coming to know God has saved me and my life. So who I am now and my life now is completely different to who I was a year ago without Christ. To be completely honest, uh, those 17 years of my life, I was pretty broken, pretty unhappy and lost. I think I was just holding on to past traumas and really questioning the purpose of life. But just as I was about to give up, God left the 99 to find me. And looking back on it, it was those seasons of solitude and I guess chronic emptiness that ultimately opened my heart to God um, because yeah last year I happened to be in hospital and I was just scrolling through Pinterest and I came across Bible verses um, like when I go through dark waters I'll be with you and I love you with an everlasting love and at the time I just remember thinking if this is true I need to find out more so with the help of a best friend I started reading the Bible and I literally fell in love with it. I began to feed off it. And I started going to church. And within, I think, the space of three weeks, I decided that I had to commit my life to Christ. And ever since doing that, God, through his spirit, has just constantly been healing renewing and transforming my heart and my mind in ways that I never saw possible. You know, God's word and his promises are, the, are my hope, my light and my strength. The reason I literally live and breathe every day. Jesus really is the light of the world and communion and fellowship with him has saved me from so much darkness and I guess filled the Jesus-shaped hole in my heart. Um, as it says in Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord really is my strength. And I think it's a massive testament to God that I'm still here today because God and his relentless pursuit of me has saved my life in ways that I, I can't even articulate, but yeah. Praise to God. Well, I hope that's encouraged you hearing from Zara. I was personally just very touched to see the way God's been at work in her life. But I've got another great story to share with you now. This man's name is Peter and he comes from our 10 o'clock service. And I remember meeting Peter at the start of the year and he was at that point where he knew things just had to change. And as we've read the Bible together, as he's taken hold of the gospel and who he is in Christ... He's been totally transformed. Let's have a listen to Pete's story. G'day, I'm Peter Anthony. I'm a member of the 10 a.m. service here at St. Matt's. I, I love this community. And the reason I'm talking to you today is about transformation and about the powerful transformation that took place in my life. But I really understood John 8.32 when Jesus said to his disciples, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I was an addict pretty much my entire life until the beginning of last year. The addiction started when I was about 14 years old and it destroyed every important relationship in my life. All the romantic relationships, it destroyed my marriage. It meant that I was um, hanging around some very toxic people. It strained the relationship I had with, with both of my children. I, I lived a a very a very shallow existence and in fact one of my partners or ex-partners said it well when she said Peter when I scratch below your surface all I get is more surface uh, I thought I tried everything uh, I tried all the self-help books I tried walking on fire with Tony Robbins 
I tried spending two weeks at a Buddhist monastery uh, in Bhutan, even tried the addiction workshop down at uh, South Pacific here in Curl Curl. Uh, I tried everything except the real thing, which was getting a better relationship with Christ. And when I think about that, I think about uh, Sean Connery, his character in The Untouchables, when he said, it's a bit like bringing a knife to a gunfight and trying to fight addiction with anything else but Jesus is just like just like uh, doing that. Uh, to tell you the truth, I thought my addiction was part of being a real man. I thought I was a tough guy, a real man, a rugby player, a wolf bar regular. But in fact, I was a coward. Um, I, was, I was running away from the truth uh, for almost my entire life. And I like what Brene Brown said about courage when she said, uh, courage is about telling the story of who you are with your whole heart. Uh, which is what I hope I'm doing with you today. Now, when I think about John 8.32, uh, the truth will set you free, there's really two parts to that in, in my mind. And I'm not a theologian or a pastor by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it's the truth part and the freedom part. Uh, and when I think of the truth part, um, I think uh, the truth is about who you are in Christ or, or who I am in Christ. And the more I understood that truth and the more I understood that relationship, the more free I was um, from, from addiction. And in fact, you can't do it without him. You can't do anything important in your life, I believe, without him. And you certainly can't kill yourself of an addiction uh, without him. Uh, I, I was living a lie. Um, I used to have this phrase to myself and my friends saying I was a, I was a small C Christian. Uh, which was which is my phony way of saying I didn't have the courage really to face up to the fact of of what I really needed to um, to face up to in my life. I was I was like a double agent, if you like, like one of those one of those spies from a different country pretending he was um, he was someone else. Uh, fortunately for uh, for me, last year uh, I contracted cancer. I had both stomach cancer and prostate cancer. Originally. The doctors thought that it uh, was metastasizing and it, it could have been terminal. And uh, as anyone facing illnesses like that, um, it does force you to really uh, accept the truth and look at your life a lot more closely. And that forced me into a much uh, closer and deeper uh, relationship with Christ and, and, and this truth. And when I think about relationships, I think, well, the quality of your life is the quality of your relationships, the quality of your friendships and, and your personal and romantic relationships. And the quality of my life has definitely expanded and improved as I deepened my relationship with Jesus because he is the most important relationship in my life now. And I bring him into my life every day. I wake up in the morning um, meditating to him. I sing songs to him during the day. And like any other relationship, I attempt to bring him into every part of my life. Now, the second part to this is the freedom part, um, and it is a freedom. It's it's uh, it's a freedom in, in a couple of ways. It's it's a freedom uh, from addiction. It's a freedom from lies. It's a freedom from um, living a life other than than being with him. Uh, it's a it's a freedom to understand that. But God is my father and he does love me and I'm worthy of that love. And it's, it's a freedom to enter the kingdom of God and dwell in that kingdom and, and feel that glory and majesty of, of him being in your life. And it's free to sing like I love doing with David on, on Sunday mornings, singing things like, here I am to bow down, here I am to worship, here I am to know that you're my God. Now... I think these COVID times make us all afraid. Uh, and I know uh, when I'm afraid, I'm much more likely to turn to the devil and to turn to evil ways. And I think these COVID times make us all afraid in different ways. And I also believe that we're all addicts in our own ways. We could be shopping addicts. We could be worry addicts. We could be porn addicts. We could be work addicts. We've all got our own, our own types of addictions. And uh, one thought I'd, I'd like to leave you with uh, here is that uh, when Jesus said the truth will set you free, 
He didn't say it may be set you free, it will possibly set you free, it will potentially set you free. He said the truth will set you free. And like any other promise he makes, uh, he always delivers when you do your peace. He does his peace uh, in abundance uh, back uh, in your life. So I'd encourage you, if you have an addiction of any, any type at all, to really think about um, what Jesus is offering uh, us here. And I can say definitely in my life that the truth will set you free. Well, I hope you're encouraged by Peter's story. It's just such a great reminder that the gospel has a power to transform us no matter what the circumstances we find us in. That's the wonderful thing about this good news. And it's such good news. We wanted to reach others. And that leads me to my third story that we're going to share today. It's from a lady called Valerie Clark. Now, she's no relation of mine uh, as a Clark. She's actually Nathan Campbell's grandmother. And you could call, call her an online church member. And she's been taking the opportunity through online church to share the services with those she knows around her. And it's a great story of how the gospel is not just saving and transforming people, but it's actually reaching people as well. And so have a listen and be encouraged. My name is Val Clark and I live at Narrabeen and I've been tuned in to St Matt's um, service at 5pm uh, over the period of our isolation since uh, COVID began. Um, I have a passion for seeing people saved. I've prayed for my family uh, for many years and God has worked miracles. Coming out of a non-Christian family, I saw uh, most of my family saved through the time, some right at the, the death end, but uh, they were saved. And I believe the love of Jesus is for everyone and he wants them all brought into the kingdom. So uh, I started praying uh, many, many years ago. I'd uh, walk around my avenue every morning at seven and pray for my street. Over the last months, I'm not uh, able to get around physically like I did. Um, so I've just um, enjoyed having this more freedom at home and time to be able to pray. And so um, I've started praying for the people that are close by me and I've invited them in to come to the service on a uh, Sunday night. Um, a few have come, a few keep saying no thanks, uh, not interested, but uh, I'm not giving up on them because Jesus never gave up on us and he didn't give up on me when I was rebelling. So um, the thing is we just keep hanging in there and, and be like the persistent widow, uh, keep praying. And so I have a few now that come every uh, Sunday night. They uh, come and uh, we enjoy the time together and one of my friends, the close neighbour, uh, wants to keep this service up when COVID's over. We share the word over a glass of wine after the service and uh, enjoy fellowship and a meal together. And I think that's what church is all about, uh, encouraging people to come into a deeper knowledge of God's love. And that's what we get through the sermons and through the music, it, uh, we feel the presence. We certainly feel Jesus with us on a Sunday when we're fellowshipping together. So can I encourage others out there that maybe watch it themselves to think about those around them that uh, don't know Jesus, but they need to know him. And uh, go and ask them. You might get knocked back. My very good neighbour who I'm very fond of keeps really knocking me down. But I know she'll come one day and uh, I'm sure she'll be there uh, in the kingdom in that wonderful place of eternity with the Lord. So remember, there's others out there that need to be brought into the kingdom. Uh, please pray for them. And remember, as Solomon wrote, God calls each of us to come and taste the fruits of our life with him. Bless you all. Well, I hope that encourages you hearing from how Valerie has been sharing the good news through online church. And I want to close by saying we all have an incredible opportunity over these next, next three weeks to be doing exactly the same thing, 
sharing our faith, by sharing the services that are online and so easy to invite someone to watch or share with someone online. Because for the next three weeks, as we said at the start, we've got the winter sessions with Dr. John Dixon. And I couldn't think of a better person to invite someone who's got doubts, who's on the edge, who's curious about the Christian faith, who may be skeptical even about the Christian faith, to come and to listen to someone who will explain with a depth, but also an ease and a simplicity, the great news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as I finish, I just want to commend to you the winter sessions and be a part of what God is doing to get this wonderful good news about Jesus Christ out to this world and to reach the people that we know and love so that they will know the God who loves them and who has sent his son for them so that they might have eternal life and not perish. Amen and amen.
Are you feeling warmer? Well, I hope you are. And if not warmer, I hope you're at least feeling encouraged. And how can you not after hearing all those amazing stories and after hearing the most amazing story of them all, the one about how good God and the extraordinary lengths that he was willing to go to in order to save us. What's not to love about that? And you know, if you are actually still a little chilly, I've heard laughter does a good job of getting the circulation going. You know what that means, right? We've got another crop of bloopers for you to enjoy if you stick around till the end. Uh Uh-oh. Have a great week. See you next Sunday. Okay, take two. Hey y'all, I'm Jesus. Lucky I'm the only one seeing this video. I just accidentally burped in front of it. What do you think the disciples were so afraid of? They'll see right up my nose, which is fine. Gee, this one loses battery real quick, doesn't it? I've got one at home that that lasts a lot longer. I need to stop yawning. Mm. It's exciting. Take three. Man, this is harder than I expected. In my oh, actually, you know what? I'm just starting again. I shouldn't have started again. <laughs> the meaning and purpose of life is found in the. I'm going to start again, Dave. Okay, sorry. Just didn't quite like that. Dave, you didn't test the audio. I didn't have my microphone on. (laughs) Let me stop and ask us a pastoral question. How would it change you? Blimey. I'm going to have to go back, Nath. Dave, just go back a bit. Yep, just hit start. Start. Oh, go. Ready, Dave? It's me. a new song. It's like, oh wow, what's happening here? It's an easy and simple song to sing along. You can join us. Just stand up on your feet, alright? We're gonna go this way.
Why is it stopped? Why are you not working now? What is wrong with this? This isn't working. What is wrong with this thing? What is going on? Seriously? What is going on now? Why does it jump? Why are you jumping? This is hopeless. Insert John Dixon video here. <laughs> all right, here's my intro. That's so annoying to have to do it all again. Here come my next words. Hey, if you've got kids watching with you, hopefully you were able to turn into kids' church last night, last week. <laughs> Hold on, let me do that section again. <laughs> Hold on, let me do that section again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There you go. Radio. Ha, 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 ha.